for molecules of matter uh, starts off uh, looking at density and what density actually is is the mass of an object divided by its volume um, and different materials have different densities just think about it if you were to have um, a some feathers in your hand and the same amount of volume of gold in your hands the gold would be a lot heavier in your hands and you'd feel the strain a lot more because gold has a lot higher density than feathers and calculate the density of uh, regular uh, shapes is quite easy here I have a cube uh, which has length of two meters width of two meters and a height of two meters um, and so to calculate its volume all you'd need to do is two meters times two meters times two meters which gives you a volume of eight meters cubed and let's just say its mass is one kilogram uh, that would mean that it would have a density of uh, one kilogram divided by eight meters cubed which is equal to 0 0.125 and then that will be kilograms per meters cubed look how easy it is for me to do units because of the fact i put them in my question make sure when you're doing calculating calculations to put units in because that makes calculating what your units are very very simple if you've seen any of my videos before, you'll know I like to put uh, my calculations into triangles as well, so I can re easily rearrange it. Now, mass is going to be on the top of my triangle as it's on the top of my equation here. And then on the bottom, I'm going to have density and I'm going to have volume. Now, sometimes you need to look out for the units that are being used. Uh, density can be measured in grams per uh, meter cubed or grams per centimeter cubed. And you just sometimes have to fix uh, your units around that. Now, we've seen how easy it is to calculate density of regular uh, shaped uh, objects. However, it's not so easy if you have an irregular shape, for example, uh, like this rock that I'm drawing just here. That's my rock. Uh, how would I calculate the volume of that rock? Well, you can use Archimedes' principle to calculate the volume of that rock. Archimedes found out that... Um, the volume of water displaced is equal to the volume of the object. He worked it out when he was in the bath and supposedly ran round time screaming Eureka uh, because of his discovery. Um, and we can apply this principle in order to calculate this volume of this rock. If you look over to this measuring cylinder over here, you'll see that the it has a reading on it for the volume of water currently it's at 150 centimeters cubed however let's see what happens when i drop the rock in so let's just imagine i drop the rock in now and it's now gone up to 250 centimeters cubed uh, as volume so to work out the volume of that rock i just simply do 250 centimeters cubed minus the 150 centimeters cubed and that would give me the volume of that rock at 100 centimeters cubed and then to work out the density of that rock, I'll just apply my equation. Density equals mass divided by volume. As well as looking at density, we're also going to look at states of matter and what happens when we heat and cool things down and basically look at the particles that are involved. In the first diagram, I've got a solid. And if you look at the solid structure, it's all in nice, neat rows and columns. And... They are fixed in a specific uh, position. All they can do is vibrate. They can't move around very much at all in a solid. They can only vibrate. However, when I start to heat up my solid, um, it starts to melt. Okay, And when it starts to melt, the particles have more energy. They can now slide past one another. Uh, and they can um, also be not in a fixed position so they're not fixed and that's a liquid and uh, in a gas they have even more energy uh, they're no longer touching one another and they move around randomly you can actually see the motion of gases uh, if you look into a smoke detecting microscope the change in state going from a liquid to a gas is evaporation of course and going the other way, it's condensation. And going from a liquid to a solid, that's called freezing. Now, 
you can go directly from a solid to a gas and it's rare they would ask you about it but it is called sublimation now uh, it's typical for an exam them to show a heating or cooling curve to show the change of state taking place and if you were to heat something from a solid all the way to a gas the curve's going to look a little bit like this Just like that. And what you'll notice is you get flat parts of um, the line. And this is where the change of state is actually occurring. And uh, this flattening off point um, is due to specific latent heat. And that's the energy required to change state. It would take some energy to go from a solid to a liquid. Look, you're going from being in fixed positions to being able to slide past one another. And the change in energy of melting is sometimes called the specific latent heat of fusion. And we'll talk about that a bit more on the next slide. And going from a liquid to a gas, you can see that takes even more energy. This is more of a flat line. This bit here, it, it's longer than melting. And the reason why it's longer is because it requires even more energy going from a liquid to a gas than from a solid to a liquid, as then particles are no longer even touching. You're, you're requiring lots of energy to break them away from one another. And that energy is sometimes called the specific latent heat of vaporization. You can often check the purity of a material from its uh, heating or cooling curve as well. Um, if this was an impure, um, and I'll just draw it in a different color over the top, you would see the line is a uh, you don't have clear melting and boiling points anymore uh, because of the fact there's there's more than one thing inside there you, you end up getting a, a, a very uh, non-distinctive boiling and melting point you can actually measure the specific heat uh, latent heat of formation and the specific latent heat of uh, vaporization as well um, and the way you could do that is by using a heater and a dual meter because the specific latent heat of uh, formation uh, just equals the energy divided by the mass and same with evaporation energy divided by the mass and here you have a joule meter which is measuring the energy transferred from that heater and you just need to measure the mass of water you collect now it's important when you look at this though some of the ice at room temperature will be melting so you should do a control sample first where you measure the amount of water that you get uh, just from normal and um, then put in the heater as well um, so you have that against the control and then work out the mass by doing the m in the second time take away the m from the first time to get the mass of water just from the heater um, so i said you can work out the energy it takes just by doing that for uh, to find out for formation uh, but for vaporization, what you need to do is you'd have to have a liquid and would have, be having to see the energy transferred go into a gas. And uh, same again, you've got a joule meter measuring the energy transferred. Uh, remember, energy is always measured in joules. And to work out the mass, all you'd need to do uh, is see how much the mass of water goes down. Um, so, for example, if there was 100 milliliters uh, in there at the start, um, and then there's 50, it would be about 50 grams that, that it's gone down on the balance it would read. And that would be the mass that you'd use because that's now gone into gas. The reason why this all works and the reason why the specific, there is a specific heat of formation and a specific heat of vaporization is because of the fact the internal energy is changing uh, when you change state. And the internal energy of an object is its kinetic energy plus its potential energy. And obviously in a gas, um, you've got a lot more kinetic energy as the particles are moving a lot more uh, so its internal energy is going to be increasing a lot and that's what you're going to be measuring now gases have so much energy in fact uh, they create a pressure called gas pressure and if that increases so much uh, you might even get an explosion you might have uh, seen it if you should never heat a, a can uh, which is uh, sealed the reason why is pressure will build up so much and um, you, you, you'll you get a bit of an explosion. Now, uh, here I've got some gases drawn in three different sealed containers, and I can change um, uh, the amount of pressure three ways. 
Uh, one way I've talked about a little bit, I think gases are always moving. They're always moving in a random direction. And if I was to heat them up, all that happens is my gases are going to move a lot more quicker. Okay, They're going to move with more uh, velocity, uh, more kinetic energy, and therefore the pressure is going to be higher. They're going to be colliding with the walls of their container a lot more. Um, another way to increase the pressure is increase the number of uh, gas particles that are inside there. You might have heard of uh, compressed air uh, deodorants and air fresheners. Uh, the, all that's happening there is to increase, uh, they've increased the pressure inside it by just putting more gas molecules inside it. But the pressure is also increased. If you were to put any more gas particles in, you might get a bang. Um, and there's one last way you can increase gas pressure, and that's by decreasing the volume. And as you can see, because the volume's smaller, it's going to collide with the walls of its container more, and the pressure is going to be increased. Now, pressure is measured in pascals, and pascals are basically the amount of force in a certain amount of area. So it's the newtons per meter acting. Uh, and a lot of the time, pressures are so big that you'll actually uh, see them measured in kilopascals. If you are doing combined science, you no longer have to watch. Um, you can watch if you find it interesting, but this bit is just for triple science now. And um, basically what it is, is calculating uh, volumes uh, based on pressure. Uh, there was a guy called Boyle and he noticed that there was a trend when you changed the volume uh, and that when you timed the pressure by the volume, uh, a constant was given. Every time he changed it, he got the same uh, constant times in the pressure by the volume. And because of this, you could then calculate uh, how much volume uh, that a certain amount of pressure would take up or how much uh, pressure would uh, be applied if you had an amount of volume of a certain gas. And it came up with this equation, P1V1 equals P2V2. So let's uh, put that into practice here. Uh, calculate the final pressure if a gas exerts a pressure of 25 kilopascals at a volume of 200 centimeters cubed. Calculate the volume it would occupy if the pressure was increased to 30 kilopascals. Now, I'm going to keep um, my pressure in kilopascals and keep my volume in centimeters cubed. Uh, you can change the units if you want to get your answer in meters cubed. However, I, I'm not going to for this question. So let's just do it. So 25 uh, kPa times by uh, 200 centimeters cubed equals um, 30 kPa times by the volume of 2. Now I can rearrange the equation to make V2 my subject. Uh, all I need to do is divide both sides by 30 kilopascals and I'll get V2. So V2 will equal 25 kilopascals times by 200 uh, centimeters cubed divided by 30 kilopascals and that gives me an answer of 166.6 centimeters uh, cubed um, and that sounds about right because it's less of a volume and the pressure's higher you know that smaller volumes have bigger pressure from the last slide